Good morning, Westwood, and welcome to our online service. My name is Tom Levine. I'm the Community Development Coordinator with MCCBC here at the MCCBC Legacy Apartments right in Prince George. And I'm Sarah Costa, the SALT volunteer and community support worker here at the apartments. And I'm Michelle Christensen, the Children and Family Activities Coordinator at the MCC Apartments. For those of you who don't know, we're part of the Community Connections team here at the MCC Legacy Apartments, engaging volunteers and residents and local partners in healthy relationships to build strong, safe and sustainable communities, all for the glory of God. Westwood Church, along with MCC Legacy and MCCBC, share crucial roles in the Legacy Partnership. First off, we want to say a big thank you to the Westwood family for all the generous support we continue to receive at the apartments. Without the time, contributions, and donations given by our volunteer team and our church members, it would be impossible to carry out our ministry over the past year. One thing that we've been working through this year is the challenge of building healthy relationships under COVID-19 restrictions. Although it has been a source of countless frustrations, it's led us to ask the Lord to help us to be more creative and intentional in the small and big things that we can do. For example, at Christmas time, we put together 322 Christmas stockings for each of the units at the apartments. We received 181 dozen cookies from 28 Westwood members and another 15 volunteers help us assemble and distribute the stockings. Everyone who was involved was either a part of Westwood Church or was connected to us through friends at Westwood. This really helped us to continue establishing our presence in the communities at the apartments, and many residents expressed their appreciation to our team. Most recently, 15 volunteers put together uh, 60 hours of work building and staining 15 picnic tables to put around all of the apartments. Our hope is to encourage people to spend time outside interacting with family and neighbors. This was a great time of team building and also led to a few curious residents asking, what were we up to? An important thing we've committed to is praying weekly in the communities at the apartments. Because we have not been able to meet as a team to pray together, some of our volunteers come on their own or in pairs to do prayer walks every week at the various apartments. This has been a special time as we'll often run into people outside who ask, well, what are you doing? And we get to say we're doing a prayer walk. Is there anything you need prayer for? Sometimes people will share what they're dealing with and we get to pass on the request to the rest of the team to pray for as well. We're looking forward to the summer as we plan activities around summer barbecues, as well as activities for children and families, which leads us to introduce to you Michelle Christensen, who will be working with us this summer as our children's program assistant. I've been attending Westwood ever since I was born, and some of you may remember me from two years ago as Twyla's helper for children's ministry in the summer of 2019. Now I'll be taking on a similar role here at the apartments. My role will involve running day-to-day -day programs and other community activities for the residents and children and youth. I am so excited to be involved in connecting these kids to Jesus through fun activities, snacks, and most importantly, community. If you're interested in learning more or might be available to volunteer in our summer activities, please give me a call. We're excited about the upcoming opportunities to continue building relationships and seeing God at work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So we ask that you please keep our team in your prayers and look for ways to be involved. Thank you again for all the support we've received so far. Additionally, as Michelle mentioned, we're looking for people who are available to volunteer in our kids' activities and at our summer barbecues. So if that's you or your life group, please contact our office at communityconnections at mccbc.ca or 250-640-3415. Thank you, and God bless you, Westwood. Well, good morning, church. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Hopefully, it won't be so much of a tuning in with us anymore as we'll be able to gather in person once again. But here we find ourselves. Uh, thank you for hanging out with us. I want to read from Psalm 103 this morning before we start. Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul. And all that is deep within me, bless his holy name. Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, 
who crowns you lavishly with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the soaring eagle. So come on, let's bless the Lord together as his church. Let's worship him this morning.
nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i sing you are life you are life in you death has lost its sting and though i'm running to your arms i'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your
Well, good morning, everyone, and glad you could join us this morning as we continue in our series in 1 Samuel uh, as we explore the life of David. This morning, we are going to be hanging out in chapters 18 to 20, and we are going to be contrasting two kind of themes here. We're going to juxtapose them against themselves because I think really that, that's kind of what the text does uh, on its own. And so as, as we go through it, I want to bring out two themes. So the first theme is deep friendship. And, and you know, isn't this something that we all long for? Deep friendship? I mean, if you've experienced it, if you've had that kind of deep connection with somebody where, where, where you look out for one another, where you care for one another, you stand up for one another, you have one another's backs, and, and, and you just, you connect. On, on a kind of a soul level, if you've had those kinds of deep, meaningful friendships, you know how life-giving they are. On the flip side of that, when we don't have deep friendship, deep relationship, don't we just long for it? Don't we desire it? There, there's a loneliness that, that exists when we don't have these kinds of connections. In our lives, so so one of the themes that we're going to juxtapose and see come out um, this morning is this idea of deep friendship and how much value it has in our lives. The second uh, theme that we're going to see juxtaposed against this is the idea of envy and jealousy and resentment and this kind of like wanting to wanting what the other person has and and how it just begins to just crush our soul and destroy us as we, as we latch on to envy in our own lives, and how detrimental that can be, um, most significantly to ourselves, but also uh, to relationships we have with others uh, when we allow envy to take a foothold in our lives. So with that in mind, um, we're, we're going to jump into the text. We're going to start in chapter 18. But as we do, I want you to think about this juxtaposition. The power of love to protect and build up versus the power of envy to tear down and destroy. You're going to see both of these themes running through the text as we jump in. So 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18, we're going to start right at the beginning, verse 1. It says, After David finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. This is this idea, you know, like in our culture, sometimes we talk about like soulmates or kindred spirits. This is the kind of idea, like they just have this deep connection. They feel almost like this, this oneness with one another, like, wow, we just connect on a soul level in a big way. And I, and I, I love you as I love myself, just as Jesus uh, teaches later in the gospel to, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. We see it lived out here in the life of Jonathan he loves David deeply, and David loves him deeply. This is this deep friendship that we were referring to as we started off. Let's continue. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, this last verse is very significant. Because Jonathan, Jonathan in this moment, when he takes off his royal robes and places him, them on David and takes off his armor and gives them to David, this is very symbolic. He is saying to David, I value this friendship more than the kingdom. Than being the king one day, it, it, this means more to me. He, he, He's realized, he's realized that deep relationship is more important than power and prestige. This, this is what is happening in this moment. He, he is choosing to put a deep, meaningful friendship with David over power and prestige. He's saying by this symbolic gesture, I would lay down my throne for you. I mean, what a, what a powerful gesture this is. And, and what an example to us. 
to, lay, to be willing to lay down our own power and prestige, you know, our own comfort for the sake of another, for the sake of having that deep connection with another human being. What an incredible gesture we see here by Solomon. But yet, if we continue on, we're, we're going to see the, the opposite begin to play out as well. So as we continue, it says, Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. So David's having a lot of success, military-wise. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. So David's gaining popularity here. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the woman came out from the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. And, and this close eye, this isn't the close eye like, oh, I'm going to keep a close eye on that person. They're very promising. I, I, I might want to promote them. This is like a close eye as in, I'm looking out for this guy because I think he's coming for my throne. And I don't like that. This guy is a threat to me. That's the kind of close eye it's talking about. And then it says, the day, and, and, and then we see that uh, from that day, an evil spirit came, for, uh, yeah, came up forcefully on Saul. Okay? And it says from the Lord in the, in the verse, actually, which uh, to us it seems a bit confusing, but from the Jewish way of thinking in that time is God created everything and so everything inevitably uh, goes back to God because he's the creator of all. So they weren't actually necessarily saying directly that this evil spirit came from God, but they're saying they didn't really distinguish. If a spirit came, inevitably they credited everything back to God because he was the creator of all. He's the one that allowed uh, evil to exist. They didn't see the need uh, to justify in that season. Uh, for us, that we read that and we go, whoa, wait, what? But for them, that wasn't an issue in the way that they thought in that time. But that aside, I, I want to I point out a few things here. The first is this, right? We see Saul, right after he starts becoming envious of David, this evil spirit comes upon him. And I want to point out a quote by Alex L. He says, being... Envious is poisonous to your spirit. I want to read that again. Being envious is poisonous to your spirit. When we choose envy, when we choose to see other people as a threat to our power, our prestige, when we, when we look at them and say, I wish I had their talent, or I had their looks, or I had their whatever it might be, the person that the most damage is done to is us. Envy poisons our own spirit. And, and when we open ourselves up, when, when, we, when we start to envy people, we open up a door for a foothold for the enemy, for the evil one. And, and, and this is what begins to happen, it begins to become this snowball effect, as we're going to see in, in, in Saul's life. Once we let envy in the door, it, it wants to bring a few friends. It wants to bring resentment, and it wants to bring hatred. Being envious is poisonous to your soul. And, and right after this, we see David is actually playing the lyre uh, which is a musical instrument, and, and Saul actually throws a spear at him and tries to kill him. It, it's already escalated very quickly to the point where Saul is so angry, so envious of David, that he seeks to kill him. 
And what does it say? It says in verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. Look it. There's something I want to point out here because you're going to see it as we keep going. It's a pattern. And that's this. It's a quote by Balthazar Gratian. He says, The envious die not once, but as oft as the envied win applause. So we see here, David wins applause from the people, right? Oh, he's killed his tens of thousands. He wins applause from people, and Saul becomes envious. And a part of him, there's a part of him that, that dies. There's a part of him that gives in to darkness. And, and we're going to see that as we go through the text, that every time David gets more and more applause and becomes more and more popular, the darkness within Saul seems to grow. It escalates. The envious die not once, but as oft as the envy win applause. The other thing I want to point out here is this. You see it says that that Saul was afraid of David. He was afraid that David was going to gain even the throne. And here's the thing about envy. Envy is primarily fueled by fear and our own insecurity. Right? He's afraid of David. Why is he afraid of David? Because David might take his power, might take his prestige. David might be more talented than him. People like David more than him. So we see that this is, this is becoming fueled more and more. His envy is becoming fueled more and more by his fear and his insecurity. It, it's, it's, not, it's not because of anything David himself did. I mean, if, if, if he would take a step back, and Jonathan's going to point this out to him later in, this, in the story, if he would take a step back and think about it, Every victory that David wins against Saul's enemies is actually a victory for Saul. But he doesn't see it that way. He sees it as a threat because he has allowed fear and insecurity to control his thinking. And when we do this, envy tends to escalate and become something deeper. It tends to to become resentment. And, and left long enough, even hatred. So, after this, <laughs> Saul tries all kinds of tricks. First of all, he tries to offer his, his older daughter to him, but he's not offering her to him because he, he likes David. He suddenly had a change of heart. He's thinking to himself, okay, my enemies are the Philistines. If I offer my daughter to him, then he's now more affiliated with me and the Philistines will hate him even more because of that. And, 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 and maybe the Philistines will be so angry that they'll finally finish off David and this problem will be solved for me. And, and the funny thing is, what does Saul start to do? He starts to give, uh, put David higher and higher in the army and give him more and more troops and he keeps putting David at the front of the line expecting the Philistines to kill David for him. But David just keeps having more and more and more success, which only fuels the envy of Saul. As people praise him more, as he has more victories, Saul just becomes more and more envious. And so finally, he sees that his daughter, Mishael, loves loves David. And so he thinks to himself, okay, Here's my opportunity. It didn't work when I tried to give my, my, my daughter to David the first time because David, David was humble and he said, who am I to become the king's son-in-law? So maybe the second time around, th- th- this could work. This could work. Uh, but again, David's like, you know, like, who am I? <laughs> and he says, okay, okay, fine, David. You, you, can, you can earn this. You can earn this by going, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit morbid and disturbing, but this is what the text says. He says, you can earn this by going out and getting for me the foreskins of 100 Philistines. 
So David says, okay, that sounds good. So David actually comes and brings him the foreskins of 200 Philistines. Because that's what everyone wants for a present. But apparently, that's what Saul asked for, and David gave him double. Again, more success. And Saul just gets angrier and gets angrier, and he tries to actually now capture David in his home, but Michelle, Michelle, or however you say it, she actually plays a trick on him and puts an idol in the bed and says, oh, David's sick. And then when they come back, when, when they go tell the king this and come back, she, they, they check the second time and they realize it's an idol, but by that time it's too late. David has left. He's fleed. And here's the thing. It keeps saying that Saul became more and more afraid of David. And he's trying to kill David. And, and finally, the next step that he takes is that he goes to his son Jonathan and all the attendants. This is chapter 19 now. And he tries to convince them that they should kill David. And here's the amazing thing, though. Good friends, good friends, they'll stand up for you. And this is exactly what Jonathan does. He stands up to Saul for David. And I, and I want you uh, to listen to what it says. We're in chapter 19 now, uh, verse 4. And it says, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all of Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? And it says that Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath and said, As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation, and he brought him to Saul, and, Dave, and, and he was with Saul as before. Okay. So, we see that David gets stood up for, and, and it seems like the story is beginning to change. But David uh, is going to win a great victory and Saul begins um, to get more uh, jealous again. And this is actually when he tries. <laughs> I got a little ahead of myself. This is when he actually tries uh, what I talked about, where he sends people to Michelle's house, uh, to David and Michelle's house, to try to capture him. And, and now we see Michelle also stands up for David and tricks his men. So now Saul, he's really angry. Right? He's really angry. And so he actually now sends men to go find David. And David has actually, he's fleed, and he's met up with the prophet Samuel and a bunch of prophets. And so when Saul sends men, they end up, when they see the prophets uh, there and they're prophesying, the Spirit of God comes upon them, and they start to prophesy. And they don't, they don't bother David whatsoever. And he this happens a couple times, and so finally Saul goes himself. And even Saul strips off his robes and becomes naked and starts to prophesy even amongst himself. And it kind of says, uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek, um, at the end of chapter 19, this is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? Because even he uh, was prophesying instead of going after David in this, in this moment. So the incredible thing here is that God's protection in this moment, God's protection is upon David. And actually, we've seen this quite a bit in this story, that God's, God's protection and favor is upon David. And I don't know if you've experienced this in life, but it's such a blessing when you're walking through a season of life and you, just, you can just see in, in different experiences you have in your life that God's protection is on your life and God's favor is upon your life. Like, like, just things happen that you can't explain 
other than God did it for you. God did it for your protection. God did it to further um, the call he had on your life. Whatever it might look like, God's protection and favor is on your life. Let me give you, give you a, a more modern day example of this. We support uh, missionaries in Mongolia uh, called Rob and Marlene Berg. And a while back, they had a vision to have this uh, tree planting organization called Trees of Life where they began to uh, help the locals grow fruit trees um, so that they could begin to provide more fruits and vegetables in their diet. They could have a new source of living. Um, and, and it was meant to build up the community. But in order to do this, they needed to somehow have people who were willing to give them land to do this because they couldn't, uh, they couldn't purchase their own land because they, they weren't Mongolians. They, they weren't allowed to do that. And so they started going and they started pursuing land on all these different avenues. And every time they tried to pursue land in this area or that area or another area, areas they thought were strategic, the door just kept slamming shut in front of them. And then one day, they, were just, they, they connected with this guy, and he's like, oh, yeah, I know these people. Uh, it, it's kind of way up north uh, in Mongolia, but, uh, but I, I think they, they would be open to hearing about this and, and, and open to, to giving you this land. So Rob goes up. He makes a presentation to some of the local leaders there, and that day they decide to give him the land. It's like he was striving for it in all these different ways, and then God's just like, here you go. God's favor just gave it to him in the end. God's favor was upon it, his life that he gave him that, that blessing. Because God, he loves to give us good gifts. And so we see in this, in this uh, section of, of David's life, a real sense of God's protection and favor upon his life. All right. Let's continue today. Uh, so... After that, David, he goes and he meets up with Jonathan again. We're in the beginning of chapter 20 now. And he comes to him and he says, like, here's the thing, Jonathan. What have I done? What have I done that your father is trying to kill me? I, I've never done anything against him. Why does he want to kill me? Um, and so they devise, they devise a plan to determine whether or not Saul wants to kill David. And they work out a whole plan to figure it out, which includes even a, a way for, hi, for Jonathan to signal to David whether it's safe or not safe. A and so what, what's about to happen is they're about to have this, these few days of feasts together, and it's expected that David will be there enjoying the feast with the king. So they decide that David isn't going to show up, and Jonathan's going to tell him this story about why, why he had gone to go and make sacrifices with his relatives in Bethlehem, and that's why he couldn't be there. And if Saul gets angry, becomes angry, then they'll know um, that he has it in for David. And if he's like, oh, okay, that makes sense, they'll realize that, that it's okay and, and David um, come back, can come back to the royal courts and, and this kind of thing. So this is, this is what they work out. All right? And so then Jonathan is going to signal him by shooting arrows. And if he tells him, uh, his, his servant who's getting the arrows, to, to keep going, to keep looking for them further beyond where the arrows actually were, then David would know. So th this is what they've arranged. So David isn't there the first day, and Saul gets a little curious, but he's like, oh, you know, maybe something happened. Maybe he's, he was unclean or something came up, and, you know, I'm sure he'll be here tomorrow kind of thing. But then the second day, uh, David doesn't show up. And this starts to anger him. And so uh, it says, David, it says, but the next day, this is verse 27 now of chapter 20, but the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. And then Saul said to his son, Jonathan, why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal either yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town and my brother has ordered me to, do, to be there. If I have favor in your eyes, let me go and see my brothers. And this is why he's not at the king's table. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, 
Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? Now, the English translation in the NIV has significantly cleaned this up. <laughs> this is an idiom, and let's just say if I, if I were to tell you the direct translation of this idiom, I would be getting a lot of complaint emails this week. Like, it, it, it's, it's a really derogatory thing he is saying about Jonathan and Jonathan's mother. Like, it is a really deep, full, deep, in, deeply insulting idiom that he's just said to Jonathan. And here's what I want us to understand. Uh, this is a quote by Dustin Woodward, which I think really encapsulates what's just happened here. He says, insults are the last resort of insecure people with a crumbling position trying to appear confident. Th this, is, this is what Saul is doing here, right? He's insulting Jonathan. Why? Why is he insulting Jonathan? Because he wants to appear confident even though he's actually really afraid of David and he knows that he is in the wrong in this situation for wanting to kill David even though David has done nothing wrong. He knows that he doesn't have a solid position. And so instead of engaging, he resorts to insulting Jonathan. And, and you know, how many times have, we, have you probably seen this in your life, you're having a discussion. <laughs> you, you see it, definitely see it all the time online, especially on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, woo, right? People start having a dialogue and they have different opinions. And, and so, somehow one of the people points out to the other person why their opinion logically might not line up with facts. And what does the other person do? Boom, they hit with the insult, right? They don't know how to respond they're not sure that their position is solid anymore, so they go to the insult as a way of trying to gain leverage in the conversation and appear confident. We see this all the time. Humans do this so regularly, resorting to insults. So if you're in a conversation and somebody resorts to this kind of behavior, it's due to their own security and their own uncertainty about whether their position is really a sound one. And if you do this, can I just ask you, would you stop? Like, could you, could you begin to just, you know, try in that moment to take a deep breath? If it's online, don't respond right away. And just think about and humbly think about what is this person saying and, and do they have a point? And, and maybe am I the one in the wrong if it's stirring up this desire to insult somebody instead? Insults are the last resort of insecure people with a crumbling position. And here's what happens next. Saul gets so angry that he actually takes his spear and he now hurls it at Jonathan just like he did David earlier. And Jonathan, he gets angry. But the kind of like anger that just, you know, is more like the anger that says, this is not right. And he knows that he needs to protect David. So what does he do? He goes out and he shoots the arrows for the servant. And David's hiding in the field. He shoots the arrows. And, and when the servant's getting close to him, he says, no, keep going. I think it's further. It's beyond that. And, and as and then he tells the servant to take the stuff and, and go back to the city. And David comes out of hiding. And listen to how deeply hurtful it is to these two deep, deep friends that they are going to have to be separated, that they aren't going to be able to, to remain together after this moment. Listen to this. It says, After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together. But David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship. 
with each other in the name of the Lord. Like what a what a deep friendship those two had. But here's what we see in Saul. Here's what we see in Saul in this in this moment and and a, a little bit of a spoiler alert uh, as we continue in 1 Samuel, we're going to see that this envy, this resentment that Saul has towards David, instead of protecting him from the loss of being the king, from the loss of his kingdom, from the loss of his power, it actually expedites it. It actually expedites. The very thing that he was afraid of happening actually happens quicker because of his resentment and bitterness towards David. I want us to understand this. Resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. I mean, isn't that true? Like, Carrie Fisher, this is a brilliant quote. Resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It, it, as we talked about earlier, you know, as envy becomes resentment, it, it just it, it poisons us. It destroys us. All the time, we're, we're, we're trying to use the, this, this resentment, this energy that resentment has in us, this negative energy. We're trying to use it to think about how we can destroy the other person when all the time the person that is dying inside, internally, is us. If you are harboring resentment in your life, can I encourage you to deal with it before it completely poisons yourself, before it, it causes, it leads you down paths that, that where you make choices that you're going to deeply regret? You don't want this for your life. I mean, this passage, to me, it, it emphasizes the choice we have. And so the question, the question I want to leave with you this morning is this. Will you choose to spend your energy on envy and resentment or love and friendship? And when I say energy, I don't just mean physical energy. I mean emotional energy, psychological energy, intellectual energy, all, this kind, all of who we are. Are you going to spend that on envy and resentment that poisons your own soul or on love and friendship that, that gives life to your soul and the soul of the person you're friends with? Which are you going to choose? And can I give a special encouragement here? If you are a person like Saul who is in a position of leadership Insecurity fueled, which fuels envy. If you are an envious, insecure leader, this is something that you need to deal with, or else you're going to end up sabotaging your own leadership and destroying the people who are underneath you, or at least attempting to. Can I encourage you? And if you're under somebody who's like this as a leader, I would encourage you, if you can, to find a way to get out of that situation. Find, find a way where, where you can be in a place that, that that is not your situation. I know it's not always possible, and I know life's complicated, and it's not always that simple, but being under envious, insecure leaders instead of trying to build into you and empower you and to help you to become all that you can be, they're simply going to keep trying to push you down and hold you back. And it's going to probably be very hurtful, harmful for, who, for you as a person. And so I, I just encourage you, if you are that kind of leader, you need to deal with that. You need to do some, some, some soul searching and some, spend some time with Jesus in prayer Maybe get some counseling to deal with that. But if you're under that leader, like, see if there's anything you can do to change that situation. Because that type of leadership, it, it's toxic. 
But back to, back to what we were saying here. Regardless of whether you find yourself in, in a position of leadership or not, we all get to choose in life what we're going to spend our energy on. Envy and resentment or love and friendship. Please, may I encourage you. Choose love and friendship. Let me pray for us today. Jesus, thank you that you, you chose love. You chose love. You chose love. You, you, you know, even when Satan uh, tried to tempt you with giving you power over all of these kingdoms, you chose love instead. And you chose sacrificial love. Help us, God. Help us to choose love and friendship. Help us to choose to invest our lives into that. Give us the strength, God. Give us the courage to, to, face, to face in our lives Areas where we might already be allowing envy, jealousy, resentment to gain a foothold. Help us to help us to find strategies to deal with that. Help us to lay that at, at, at your feet and say, Jesus, I don't want to carry this anymore. Help us to do that, Jesus. Give us the strength to do that. Give us the courage and resolve to do that, Jesus. And God, I pray for those um, who have those deep friendships. I pray that you would protect those you would protect those relationships for them and you would help them to continue to deepen those um and for those who who aren't walking in those meaningful relationships god would you lead them to people that they could connect with on this kind of level and would you be able would you build and give them just the just the benefit of having those friendships in their lives god help them as they desire this would you just bless them and, and give them favor in that area of their life We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sin. Compares to your.